Today's department is the branding department. Millions of followers and subscribers across social media, multiple seven-figure entrepreneur. I have with me Chris Doe. When we talk about brand, it's not what things look like. It's about the emotional, irrational feeling that we have towards something. The way that we do that is we have to be able to let people in on who we are on a personal level. Every person can do this. The whole point of building a strong personal brand is to get in touch with yourself, to have high self-awareness and self-acceptance. When people show up as themselves, then all of a sudden, we as humans look at the other person on the other side of the screen and say, oh, they just like me. You're really relatable. It's the easiest thing to do. It's the most natural thing to do, yet it's the least common thing that people do. If somebody was like, okay, I want to put myself out there, based on your observation, especially even in the last years as you've really grown, like, well, how would you encourage somebody to be like, start building your brand by making these kinds of videos then? I hope your audience finds this to be super valuable. Here goes. Welcome to the department where we interview people who are killing it in their department. And I'm excited because today's department is the branding department. If you search, what is a brand? If you search branding 101, if you search how to build a brand, this person shows up. I'm fan boying right now. And I have with me Chris Doe, who is an Emmy Award winner, uh, also an Inc. 5000 recipient. Yes. Millions of followers and subscribers across social media, multiple seven figure entrepreneur and husband of the year and the drippiest <laughs> out there honestly like look at the <laughs> look at the vibes and someone uh who appreciates uh fashion every time i see chris the the bags the brands off-white louis alex studios uh the roly let's go hey i just want to say game recognized game brother dude that's love for real <laughs> Um, I've been oh. I've been following Chris for some time. I would say even before 2020, and we can even talk about in a little bit how 2020 I think was very big for your YouTube presence. Um, but number one, just thank you for being on. This is honestly incredible. I'm I'm so glad we can do this, Omar. So uh, I was, you know, if you go on YouTube and you type in what is branding, uh, the the video that comes up is an interview that you did, a very short three four minute video with Marty. How do you pronounce it? Newmeyer. Newmeyer. And you asked him, uh, you know, what is branding? And, you know, he answers the way he would three years ago. So I would ask you today, um, what is branding today? I don't think branding has changed. I think the modern conception of or the modern concept of brand hasn't changed since Marty's written about it. The ways in which we manifest the touch points change and evolve a little bit. But let me just try to make it really simple for everybody to understand when we talk about brand, it's not what things look like. It's about the emotional, irrational feeling that we have towards something. The fact that we're willing to wait in line to queue up to get something or to search and scour the internet to find a little tidbit, a morsel of like when the new drop is coming or anything. There are a couple of people, a couple of companies that have this in spades and the rest of us are mere mortals trying to achieve that level. And the way that we do that is we have to be able to let people in on who we are on a personal level or to create certain expectations that are positive associations with that company. And we can get into it as deep as you want, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Think about associations. You can have negative associations or positive, and that's part of your brand. So if you show up and you treat people poorly and you're a bit of a jerk, well, that is your brand. It's a negative association. Conversely, if you're generous, if you're always kind to people, you you take an extra minute to to really genuinely want to help people, that will be the positive association or your positive brand. So something that comes to mind as you explain that is there's an organic nature to it, but then there, it seems like there's also a very intentional nature to it because should you be surprised that people feel a way about your brand or you should be like, no, this is exactly what we decided because it's, it's like being yourself sometimes isn't a subconscious decision or I don't you know what I'm, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if always that people are intentional about it and, or if intentionality is always good. And I'll tell you why. Oftentimes what people think is, oh, I have a really strong brand and there's a team of people sitting here thinking about like how you should show up in the world. That ain't you. And it's very manufactured. And sometimes the team of people is just you. 
and you say, well, I need to be this person to be accepted, to be loved, and not to be ridiculed in public, so I'm going to put on this persona, and you become that person. You're too crafted, too manicured, uh, too much layers of varnishing, and it was like, well, who are you? And this is why when when people show up as themselves, or sometimes they show you a little bit more of like, this is what it looks like when I'm really messy and ugly and I'm not having a beautiful thought or a beautiful philosophical moment in my life, I'm just going to share with you. And then all of a sudden, we as humans look at the other person on the other side of the screen and say, oh, they just like me. You're really relatable. My God, I didn't know you struggled like that. I didn't know you have bad hair days. You know, I... I have bad hair days every day, but I'm just putting it out there. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, like, oh, they're they're not that weird. Or they, they remind me of my cousin or my dad or my sister or my mom. And I like them a little bit more. So, I mean, it's because, like, there's, there's so much thought at the same time. I, I'm trying to get to a place of, like, somebody's at zero. Or, or, or I guess I would ask you, like, how long did it take you till you knew what your brand was or... That's a very good question. And we, we talked about this on a different podcast, but what you see, what happens with people typically is when you see a first piece of content, that's going to be the least like them as a real person. Because that's them thinking, I don't want the world to think badly of me. I need to show up as a professional or as caring or as loving or as an athlete. And I always have everything buttoned up. Over time, what that person hopefully starts to realize is, man, that's a lot of work to pretend to be that person. And I don't know, maybe one day I'm just going to show like, hey, here's the weird thing about me. And then they start to pull back the layers and then they realize, okay, I don't care anymore if the world judges me a certain way. I'm just, I got to just be me. It's the easiest thing to do. It's the most natural thing to do, yet it's the least common thing that people do. So what happens is over time, if you notice a personality yourself, our, our mutual friends, you might see this evolution and you think, oh, the person's changing. Mm. They're not. They're becoming more of themselves. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Have you ever wondered to yourself or asked yourself the question when you watch my content, how the heck does Omar's quality of video look and sound so dang crispy? It's literally the number one question I get asked, whether it's privately in the DMs or people commenting on my videos on Instagram or even on YouTube. The reality is I believe the quality of videos that I've been able to produce has been the recipe to my success online. And I wanna give you access to my live document where I've listed out everything I use, both for the podcasts I create, to the YouTube videos I make, as well as to what I use for my smartphone to make it look and sound amazing. The reason I put it on a live doc is because I keep this document updated in real time with everything that I'm using. So just head over to the videodep.co forward slash crispy, or just click the link down in the show notes. Let's get back to the conversation. That's really good. You know, what's funny is as someone who like does video, teaches video, you know, there's this wave of like hyper edited content. And I noticed this about last year in the summertime that I started consuming videos that weren't as edited, you know, jump cuts fast, you know, text and like crazy overstimulate stimulating content. And I'm like, the, the videos I'm attracted to are actually videos that aren't heavily edited. And it looks like the pendulum is even swinging back to, you know, not intense edits. And there's this YouTuber that kind of blew up recently. I don't know if you know who he is. What is his name? Uh, Sam? Sam Sulek, have you heard of him? No. Dude, 21-year-old bodybuilder, mm. 45-minute daily vlogs, no, just jump cuts, no text, no music, no nothing, 2 million subscribers in 30 days. And he's just driving. He's got his mic. He actually has his mic clipped onto his hat. But I, I say all that to say that there is, it's funny how it's like a journey of undoing. Some people, I think, for, for, for a guy like him, maybe he has like zero insecurity, so he can... Would you say insecurity is probably the killer of all brand builders? It can be, but insecurity could be your brand too. Mm. And this is a really weird thing to say, like, I'm really insecure about X, Y, and Z, and hopefully you don't judge me too poorly. And just to put it out into the universe, the, the whole point of building a strong personal brand is to get in touch with yourself, to have high self-awareness and self-acceptance, and to say, like, hey, this is the way it's going to be. You know, I can sit here and wish all day and night my hair is going to grow back. It's not, and it's okay, and I'm cool <laughs> with it. You know, I, I know what my limitations are. I know what my zone of genius is, and I'm not going to oversell my shortcomings and undersell my genius. I'm going to celebrate both. I'm really good at a couple of things. I'm terrible at lots of things, and that's all of me. What would you say is 
like some of the best brand building type of content. What do you mean? Like if somebody was like, okay, I want to put myself out there based on your observation, especially even in the last years as you've really grown, like, well, how would you encourage somebody to be like, start building your brand by making these kinds of videos then? Okay. I'm going to give you a funny answer. Okay. Dang it. <laughs> no, go, go. <laughs> My funny answer is this, is the best kind of content you can, um, pursue, consume to build your personal brand is to go to see a therapist. Because right. what the hell are you talking about? You're as broken as everybody else and you're, you're fronting as much as everyone else. So we can learn the tools, what kind of cameras we're using, what kind of lighting setup. We can do all of that. That's not going to help you. But if you were to invest time, money, and energy towards something, go figure out who you are. Like heal, learn mm -hmm. to love thyself. And then hold up your freaking iPhone with crappy audio and video and just start talking to the camera. That's going to be the best brand possible. You may not become an overnight sensation. You might not become the Sam guy. Who cares? The whole point is not to chase those numbers. The whole point is to just fall in love with who you are. You'll be much more attractive. You know, we talked about this at a conference recently about what makes people so charismatic. What is it that draws people to them? Like there's this magnetic being and you kind of know and it's usually not the prettiest woman who walks in the room. It's not the buffest, coolest looking guy who's like, who hunts with um, a bow and arrow and, and is like six foot two, 225 pound rip top to bottom. She's not that person. It's actually some person who's kind of doesn't call too much attention to themselves, creates space for others and is super comfortable in their own skin. There's something really attractive about that. And the most beautiful thing about this is every person can do this. You may not be born with great genetics and cheekbones and height and physical gifts, but you can be born to, to learn to love yourself and to create space for others to do the same. Dude, it's so good. You have great cheekbones, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's why you said that. No, I'm just kidding. Subliminally, I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag cheekbones. Yeah. Um, so do you, you help people build their brand is, or companies build their brands? And stuff? I mean, I'm, you probably have done it at a, at a big level. So like because like we're in a era where single individuals can build a brand a yes. personal brand but then companies could build crazy good brand right what are some themes throughout either or both of those that like that matter at the same level i think foundationally the concept is the same philosophically the application is very very different so when we work with corporations like really big companies they're trying to figure out what are we, and we're a group of people with opinions, and no one opinion seems to be it, so it tends to be very watered down, very generic, and then there's like zero personality. What we try to do, especially with most companies or corporations, is to help them figure out what is the origin story. Like when the founders came together to do something, they wanted to change the world, they wanted to make it better in some way. Somewhere along this journey, we've forgotten about that mission. Mm. So we got to go back and rediscover it. So we got to go back in time and find that. So that's what it is. Now, the difference here is there's a whole committee still making decisions. And we, we have to make decisions that's smart for the business growth. Because when we make poor decisions, like recently with Bud, I believe, they did something with transgender and it just messed up their brand in a way that is going to literally cost them billions of dollars. Lives are on the line. So we don't want to mess around with that. So that's why it's usually there's attorneys, there's marketing departments, there's strategists and writers, and they have to do this because they have to make calculated decisions. And we get that. If you take it over to the personal side, there is no committee. It's just you. Mm. It's just got to be you. And I've said this recently, building a brand isn't a product of invention. It's a product of memory. Who are we? When we're between three to nine years old, that's who we are. But through conditioning, through parenting, through schooling, we've lost that because our entire society punishes people who stand out. You're an anomaly. You're going to get put in a different classroom. You're going to get held back. You might ride the short bus. Who knows? And all of a sudden, your entire world, your social structure collapses around you because your teachers, your friends are now going to look at you and treat you differently. So we've learned to, to um, go along is how we get along. And we've, we've done a lot of going along. Mm. And I'm just trying to help people and to give them permission to like, you know what? Why don't we do some of that deep work? Why don't we go into the shadow and figure out the things that you have guilt and shame over that create anxiety and frustration for you that makes you angry? Let's explore that because that's the real you. And we have to learn to recognize those parts, to embrace them as who part of us, not to say we have to accept them, 
but to say like, okay, we can work on those things, but we're not going to pretend they don't exist. And so when you walk in a room and you 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 see somebody, it's like, oh, that person's so pretentious. Mm-hmm. They're pretending to be something. Like, don't talk to me like that. I'm just another person. Don't pretend like you're better than me. I'm tired of that. And I'm sure everybody in this room is tired of it too. And I will tell it to your, to your face. So you, you, guys, you mentioned earlier that like branding is like the emotion, but then maybe an immature way of approaching starting a brand is caring about the, the, the image up front. That's usually how people start. Right. So like, I started that way. I'll just put it out there. So it was like, let's get the logo down. Let's get the colors down. Yeah. Let's get all. So if somebody, maybe when you had your agency or what, you know, do you still have it or? It doesn't do anything. It still sits there. Okay. So like you, you know, somebody comes to you and like, hey, we need a logo. And you're like, we need a brand or what's the brand? Like what? Because I would just imagine people are with the websites, the colors and all they're, yeah. they're focusing on all that stuff, which has less to do with the emotional side of things yeah. as far as getting people to feel something. What, Like, how do you deter that priority? Let's talk about that. Um, the word brand and branding has become a catch-all phrase to mean all kinds of different things to people. And so we need to kind of clarify. Most people don't come in and just say, I need a logo. They're like, I need a new brand, Chris. I'm like, let's unpack that word. What do you really mean? Let's explore why you need it and what's happening in the business and the market. Tell me about the motivations behind this. We're going to have a conversation. I don't care that the clients know the right terminology to use. I'm not expecting them to. I, as the professional, need to know that. If you're a doctor, somebody comes in and like, oh, I need surgery. Like, okay, I understand. Like, let's talk about the pain that you're experiencing while you're here. And then we'll figure it out together. And a lot of creatives, they think, well, the clients are supposed to know all the terminology and the strategy. I said, do not wish for that future because then you will just be a production monkey at that point. We need this and put it that typeface and those colors and we need 14 videos that are going to instant. We don't want that. So we have to learn to speak the language for them. So when they come in, they're going to say something like, I need some new branding. I need to rebrand. Let's talk about what that means. Then we start to unpack that. Oftentimes what it really means is we have a bad relationship with our customers. We need to fix that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now we do real branding, which is, how's your product? How's your customer service? Let's start there. What's the onboarding, offboarding process like? What are the reviews and the feelings and the sentiment of people towards your product service organization? So we have to do a little bit of like um, empathy mapping. We have to do a little bit of research and kind of checking in with all the employees. Okay, now we can start because that's our baseline. Here's where we're at as a company. Through our, across all the touch points. Here's where we'd like to be. Are we committed to this now? It's one thing for us to say we care about customers and we make great products when in, in fact those are not true. So there's something that I read from the late Tony Shea from his book, Delivering Happiness. And he said, forget the brand. And everybody's like, what? What do you mean forget the brand? He goes, get the culture right, the brand will follow. Mm. No company has a strong brand with a poor culture. Because, and I'll tell you a little story right now, if I used to be a fan of a particular airline, I'll just say it's Southwest <laughs> Airlines. They're goofy. They're funny. They give their flight attendants a lot of leeway with how to do very procedural things. And so I laugh and I'm like, hey, that's remarkable the way you told me don't cry like a baby when the plane's about to crash. Okay, I get that. That's funny. But then I had a bad experience that with the flight. happened? Huh? Somebody came over the microphone. And they said, say funny things. They're like yeah. stand-up comics that are flying a plane. I, I I'm love just saying it. that the, the plane's tripping out, and they're like, yo, don't cry like a baby. I'm <laughs> well, sorry. no, this uh, is like before the plane takes off. They're like, okay, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, if that person's acting funny, slap them <laughs> and then put on your mask. Or they have fun, and we know that they're saying in jest, not literally to go do this. So it's the fun airline. It's a little cheap, but it's fun. And then I'm flying on the airline, and... One of the flight attendants treated me really poorly. Like I was like, I'm not being rude. Why would you talk to me like that? And it's last, it's created a negative emotional feeling that I'm willing to for free badmouth them right now. Mm -hmm. I even sent them a review saying I've had a horrible experience. I'm reconsidering booking with you. That is one employee out of thousands or tens of thousands of employees. Wow. When you get the culture wrong, the brand dies. Dang. You know what's crazy? You said the 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 product and the like the service. Um Something like Chick Fil A, yeah. It was all about let's just make better chicken sandwiches because they were they were actually up against another company at, when they first got started, and they're like, hey, let's not do what they're doing. Let's just make a better sandwich, and it like made Chick Fil A what they are now. Yeah, dude, social media coming out now, dude. Like Chick Fil A is awful. 
but like their customer service is on par but because i'm learning about like how they're make now making but you, something you mentioned about how companies can lose it along the way because they're trying to scale uh, or that their their goals may be changed or you know what have you but uh, it's crazy how much they that saying that like it takes a lifetime to build re, build a reputation and like 5 seconds to lose it or whatever like that's so real uh when it comes to companies and when you think about it at that level it's and like it's funny how like when we think about branding we think about okay what are the major companies like who would you say let's say that maybe everybody would essentially know like they're killing it they have strong brand it's very easy there's this thing there's some science behind this and i don't pretend to know all the neuroscience but in our brain if you think of your brain like, like a japanese bento box right there's a little compartment for rice uh, cucumber protein something like that um, potato salad there's compartments and our brain kind of works in that way too. So in every category of every product, there exists maybe number one or number two, sometimes three or four, but not that many. And it's because uh, it's a complicated world. We can't be sitting here remembering every, every single thing. Like if you had to figure out like who is the first person to break the four minute mile, you would, you would know who, who was the first person to step on the moon. But who's the second person who did that? Mm -hmm. And you kind of just start to forget. Like for you, I see that you're a fan of LaCroix now they have a, a place in your heart and your mind. When you go to the store, you're not looking at all the other brands. How many brands of sparkling water are there? There's a lot. And to each person, they're going to have a different preference. And so it's always the battle for the heart and the mind. And we mm -hmm. know, okay, you're rocking fear of God stuff. So fear of God for you is, is killing it. And and based on the line of people that are ready for their, their pop-up shop, clearly they've they've cultivated community and culture around a community, that's something that's really powerful. And so we know, and I'll tell you how you know, and everybody can answer this question differently versus like, here's what Chris thinks, is think about the different products and services you consume that you have a preference for, that you can't explain, that you're willing to pay more money for. That's good. So this is really clear. When you're competing on price, you have no brand. Unless your brand is... We're cheap. That's Walmart's brand. And for some people, they love that. But in most places, if you're competing on price, you have no brand. Because almost the definition of brand is preference and willingness to pay a premium. Mm. That's it. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. That's really good. That's some, something I've been learning with, with, with selling my coaching. Because it's, you're literally selling invisible. It's, it's not, there's nothing tangible to it. I have to determine the value but then I have to get really good at um, uncovering that value. And so that's why this year, this year I've committed one of the skills I wanted to grow in is sales. And I know you talk about this and I love your philosophy, helping especially creatives uh, determine these things and how to, when to say the price and not, you, you talk about like not uh, having to justify it necessarily. And, um, but I, I've had a lot of, I started as a freelancer, video, photography, I've been doing that for 15 years until it got to the place where it makes sense to like probably teach this stuff. And a pattern I saw even in my own journey was like, like how do I even charge? And I think that's a, I think a lot of people who are entrepreneurs, especially online entrepreneurs are asking that question. What would be your philosophy around that? The shortcut on how to charge, super easy. E easy to understand, really difficult to do. And I'll explain the concept and then I'll tell you why it's really difficult to do. If we were to think, Let's just say all creatives are very fair-minded, egalitarian, ethical people. Clearly not true, but let's just pretend for the sake of our conversation, this is true. What would be the most fair thing to do in the marketplace? To have a fixed price for all products and services or, or people who come in? Or name your own price? What do you think the answer would be? What is more fair for someone to name their own price or for you to have a fixed price? What do you think? What's more fair? Yeah, what's the fairest thing to do? Pay what you can or this is the price? I guess pay what you can sounds like pay really what you can, right? Like if you went into a cafe and their their literal sign says pay whatever you can, today you're not having a good day. You're laid off. You go in, it's like I don't have two bucks. Somebody's like I'm having a great life. This meal's worth thirty dollars, and the average of it will probably be the price in which they would have set in the first place. But yet this is a very egalitarian thing. Pay what you can. Church works like that. We understand these concepts, right? Okay, kinda. What do you mean? Because it's 10%. It's a suggestion. Uh, it's not a rule. Huh? 
No, yeah, it I, is I mean, a rule. No, it's not a rule, but but ten percent applies oh. to wherever. So it is a set price. Like God is giving a set price. Is God really? Where's Be, the church? Because it's it's ten percent of whatever comes in. Your income. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the same for everybody. It, it, well, it's still well, it's still pay what you can <laughs> because yeah. somebody has ten million. That's a lot more than what somebody who's like I'm broke. It still pay what you can. And it's still up to you. It's a suggestion. Sure. You may feel like as a rule, but I, I say it's a suggestion. The mere fact that you show up is a suggestion, okay? Because there's no gun to head. Right. Right? Okay. Let's, <laughs> that may or may not be a great piece of content no, <laughs> for your audience, but let's get back to it. Yeah. So pay what you can. So let's just say that's fair, okay? Yeah. Are, are we in agreement that it's fair? Yeah. I'm sure in the comments they're like, F you, no, Chris. No, not they're fair, not. But, <laughs> I, just think, I, do, I do think going to a restaurant and it's like, give whatever you can is different than here's a restaurant, it's 10% or it's a percentage of whatever you make. There's a difference. I mean, I, you know. Right? Are we doing semantics can, now? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> go, 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 go. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Go. We're gonna get hung up on <laughs> no, the concept, right? Yeah. Like, um, like the, you know, you go to the airport and there's a guy shining shoes. You like whatever you want, right? That's Everybody it. has a different idea. Some people will give them a lot. Some people will give them a little. But Blair Enns has written about this. There's a person who shines shoes at a very specific airport. That every time he's there, the person does such a great job. He makes sure to go there, and he's like, "I'll pay what you want." thing and he goes on average this is how much money he makes and he makes way more money than if he just said eight dollars or twelve dollars mm. okay he, now he's incentivized to do the very best job he can because he knows how you feel about that service is going to be what you're going to pay i think that's a really beautiful business model mm. let's put it into the real world now when we do a video project what are we going to charge? Well, we can charge a flat fee. Uh, you want to do a two-day setup? It's five grand, let's just say, and includes X, Y, and Z. And all our customers, it's five grand, so it's a fixed fee. But what if we said, what is the size of the problem you're trying to solve? Let's charge you a price that's appropriate for, for what it is you're trying to do. Well, then that forces us to have a real strategic conversation that's around business that's going to impact the person. It could be... I have no problem that's going to be solved by video, then it's your obligation and your duty to say, well, then there's no reason for you to give me money to do this. It's actually bad business practice. Mm. In that case, I need you to go talk to this person who does strategy, this person is copywriting, you need an email funnel. We know some people, talk to them. And if that all works out and you still feel like you have a problem that we feel that can be solved with video, please come back. I'd love to work with you, but mm -hmm. I don't feel right taking your money right now. Yeah, I will take it if you insist, but I don't recommend it. And the funny thing is when you do this, what happens in the relationship between you and that person? What happens with the esteem, the trust, the feeling like you're looking out for them? It's not going to go down. It'll probably go up. It's really good. Right? And every time I tell a customer, not every time, a lot of times, I tell them, I don't want to take your money. I will take it if you force me to, but I think you could do other things. Then they turn around, they insist to give me the money. I'm like, okay, I've done the best that I can. You don't need plastic surgery. You don't need uh, like to climb Everest. You don't need that fast car. But if you want to, I will sell it to you, but I've done my duty. So if each person that comes to you and says, I have a million dollar video problem, what should the budget be? It should be some percentage of that. It's not a million dollars. Let's say it's 10% because we're on the God thing. 10%, so $100,000. Is that fair? Great. Well, I have a $10,000 problem. Okay, 10% of that, $1,000. Does that help you? Great. Yeah. And, and that's how it should work. So that will help them to understand the value conversation isn't the value of your time. It's the value of the outcome you achieve for the other person. Really Big good. difference. Yeah. Mindset shift. I mean, and that's like sales like level up too. Just speaking their problems or like speaking into their problems and their needs, not necessarily what you are all going to do. Yeah. So, so you're, like, you're, you're uncovering like four, I think four skills within that framework that I just mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing diagnostic, you're doing strategic, you're doing consulting, you're doing sales. And by the way, you're also bringing in video expertise in that case. Yeah. And I, I mean, just with my, th that offer I have, which is, I call it dialed in a day. So I, I go into an office space or somebody's home if they have this space. Number one, I mean, my brain works cool because I've messed with a lot of gear in a long time and I've set up a lot of shots. 
I like I could see a space and then recommend the gear. And then even I come in, I set it up with my team and then we train. It's like invaluable. Like it's it's an offer that honestly sells itself type thing. But the pricing thing, I've always had. How a, much you charge to do that? It's it's evolved this year because. Just tell I'll, me the price, Omar. 15 grand. Oh, that's a lot. For the service. Nice. Okay. Not, with the, not gear, with the gear. Not with the gear. This guy knows what he's doing. 15 grand. That's pretty good. Yeah. I like that. Um, and and it's evolved to that because I started with 15 grand and it included the gear. Okay. So there's a level to it too where I'm like in my knower's knower. I'm like, this isn't worth it. And you're who? My knower's knower. Like, what is that? <laughs> you shut like, your belly, but I don't know where <laughs> I, I don't have a knower like, knower. You ever deliver what? deliver on a on a project or a, a, you know a, with a client and you finish it and you're like, I can't charge that much anymore. It's not it wasn't worth my it wasn't worth the time to do that. No, I've never done that. Really? Wait, wait. No, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my bad. So you <laughs> finished the, question. You finish yes. the project. Yeah. And you're like, like yeah. I can continue to do that financially. I'll ruin myself. Yeah. That's exactly. what you're saying. Yes. I had that feeling all the time, actually. Yeah. So I started it off. It was like 50 grand yeah. and included the gear. So I probably made like five grand for the day. Right. And then, and then I'm realizing also the problem that it's solving. You know, like I was learning a little bit more about that. And the, and the client that's, that would pay it because they see the value in, in it. And so, it's funny. It's like when you, I think you talk about this too. Like usually when a client pays even more, they're usually easy, easier to work with too. You know, they're just they like, I don't know, just the case. So right now I've landed on 15 and yeah. usually it's like, it's a podcast setup, you know, because it's multiple cameras. Um, and then I think the value is really the training. Um, but I think, I think the question I was trying to get to is like, I kind of don't know where to stop. But you just said like, dang dude, that's kind of pricey. But then I had like I had somebody tell me like, dude, you should be charging twenty five grand, and here's the reason why: because you're adding a level of um, interior design too. It's not just the gear; it's like you're you're transforming a space. Yeah. Okay. There's no there's no way there's no real answer to this, but there's no end into what you should charge because as you level up customers, the customer's problem is bigger every time. Mm. So if you stay within a very specific small to medium sized business, 15 grand, they're going to choke on that. And then your pool of clients is going to start to contract. Right. Whereas if you keep leveling up, somebody's like, hey, I want to look like Johnny, but I actually run a $200 million company. So let's let's take the abstract lesson, the meta, and take it to your specific business. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So the way that you, you're like dialing a day catchy it's got alliteration it's got you know nice flow to it but ultimately what you're doing is, is the way i would sell this is i'm going to tell you right now you're going to overpay for what i do except for when you factor into one thing how long would it take for you to do with your team how many iterations would you have to go through and when at what point will you be happy with the result do the math in your head right now whatever that number is I'm going to give you a new number and you're going to just see if that is above or below, right? That's really good. So this is all I would do. That, that, that's in an abstract framework. There's a friend of mine. I can't say who he is exactly, but he transformed his business. The guy does over half a million dollars in revenue in a year and he's a one-person company, mm. right? One-person company and he works like 10 hours a week. It's beautiful. And the thing that he shared with me, which I, I hope your audience finds this to be super valuable. Sorry, friend, for revealing your secret, but I'm just going to do it. Here goes. He used to charge a set fee for what he does. And he works in the web space. So he designs and builds websites for his clients. And then he realized, okay, now that I finished that project, I'm on the hunt for another project and that can be grueling. So his fundamental shift isn't what he did. He just changed how he presented it and how he offers service. So he changed from a fixed fee to a subscription fee. And I'll talk about that, okay? So he goes to his prospects and says, okay, you need a website. And websites aren't these static things. They need to be updated, security, all the time. Things are happening all the time. It's like a, like a living organism. It's like a house plant. It needs to be taken care of, otherwise it will die. If you had to hire an art director, a copywriter, a web developer, and a designer, what would that cost? Let's just do the numbers together. Let's just say that number wound up being 400 grand. He goes, that's just 400 grand. But if you have to fire, replace them, now you're talking about compensation, whatever, time. exit package, time, training. So now you're losing even more money. Let's add another 100 grand on top of that. Now, if you had to hire a recruiter, we know we have to pay them 20% on top of that. So let's just keep doing more math. And then you have to 
find a workspace for them to work. You have to give them the software, the hardware, and then how often do you maintain that? So I'm telling you right now, all that can just disappear. Let's just say that's an $800,000 number. I will do this for you for less than X percent of that annually. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build the site for you. I'm going to maintain it. And we're going to have quarterly conversations. And we're going to keep updating things as we go. Does that sound like it works for you? They're happy. He has five or six clients. That's all he needs. He doesn't have to keep chasing new clients all the time. But the onus is on him to constantly evolve and deliver greater value over time. Good. This is the subscription model. It's different than retainer model. And I only recently understood the difference between a retainer and a subscription in this way, because I had time to speak with Ron Baker, who's like a master at economics and accounting, explain this to, to me, or actually to the audience. A retainer is I pre-buy time in bulk for a discount. So we're always selling time. So I'm going to buy 20 hours of your time at, instead of $200 an hour, 120. So you're great. I got good cash flow, And now I'm always worrying like, what hours am I using? And so I'm just going to try to fill that up. So you may have a policy in the contract where some minutes or hours roll over, but not all of them. So next week you add another five hours and you just keep doing that. So they burn the hours they don't use. You get to charge them more for the hours they go over, but that's the model. A subscription is we don't look at it at hours anymore. You're going to pay no matter what. And I'm and my team are going to obsess over how to keep increasing the value to you as a customer. Totally different. We move away from looking at blocks of time to looking at value created. Mm -hmm. So the way that you honor that and the way that you keep clients for a really long time is like, you know, Mary, I've been thinking about the way you're doing this and I think we need to upgrade the, the microphone or this. And, you know, I'm noticing that as you're aging differently, we need to adjust the lights. I got to fly in. We're going to take care of this. We got you, Mary. That's the difference. Yeah. No, that's really good. What was the first thing you did creatively to start exchanging for money, like service-wise? Was it graphic design? No, it was washing cars. Washing, oh, creatively? Creatively. Okay. <laughs> it's trying to be funny. That was not funny. <laughs> first thing, yeah, it's around graphic design. Okay. Yeah, I was a production artist. Cool. Because, like, dude, it's funny because you are you have such good business acumen. And I, observation, generally speaking, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to make blanket statements, but oftentimes creative creatives get into business and offering them their services and they typically they they have a hard time making it because the business part just kind of messes with them uh, maybe they they get a little too attached to the craft or i don't know when, when did you feel like uh, two questions of it's what are the what what would you say to a person who's like really good at a thing let's say video graphic design photography but like having to get good at business could rob them from just focusing on like the craft. Okay. Can can you remember that question? Because I need to correct something before I answer that question. Okay. Will you remember your question? Yeah. Okay. Will you remember it, Art? Art's like, oh, you're in the headlights over there. <laughs> Art, just remember it. Whatever it was that you just asked, okay? All right. You said you have good business acumen. I don't. I'm going to tell you right now. I have terrible business acumen. Because I was once like all of you. I really was. I was terrible at business. The first three businesses I started, I completely failed. I didn't understand the difference between revenue and profit. Like, you know how you said, oh, I would use to package $15,000, $5,000 was profit, right? Mm -hmm. Any profit, because somebody had to go there and do that work. And if you had to pay that guy to do right. that job, then there might be $3,000 left for profit. Right. So it's not even understanding those principles in my mind that that's how I ran my first business into the ground. I'm like, what? I don't understand this at all. In my first business, I was 17 years old. I just put it out there. Okay. So I'm struggling to build a business and I'm just figuring it out as I go. I don't know what to do, what to say. And someone on the internet, I, I want to say her name is Christine. It's not Christine. And she's from San Francisco. She was on a Twitter live space call with me and we're just talking about something. And she goes, what people don't fundamentally understand about sales and many of the concepts that you're teaching is they think that by looking at it, they understand. Mm. They don't. It's like asking you and me to play chess and I'm a world chess champion. That would be your client because they're in business. They know negotiation and sales. And you say, try to beat them at chess and you're great, but you don't know how to play chess. They're like, oh, okay. And you're blindfolded. Try to play that game. Try to win. Mm -hmm. So that's me as a creative person. And I think I only became successful because of two or three different things. Number one 
a stupid belief in self. Like, I just love myself. I'm like, this work is good. Man. <laughs> I don't know why people don't want to pay me, but one day they will. They just haven't figured it out yet. That's number one. Mm-hmm. And number two is just having the belief in self and actually having real skill. So putting in your 10,000 hours, as Malcolm Gladwell describes it, I have a skill. So I love myself and I think the skill and the self are matching. The rest of it, you just figure out on the job. But it wasn't until I hired a business coach or actually worked with business people who who taught me, not literally taught me, but through observation. I'm like, oh, oh, you're doing things a little bit differently. I would rather do that because what I'm doing is really painful. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to bid. That's good. And so every time you level up, you buy a little bit more time to play the game. You know, you're not old enough to go to the arcade, but when we were at the arcade back in the day. Bro, I'm only, th- I mean, I'm 33. I've gone to arcades, yeah. dude. <laughs> Retro arcade. <laughs> I'm talking about for people who are old enough to remember right, when sorry. you had a you're pocket full of quarters. Machines. Shut up. No, <laughs> not that old. Come on. Okay. When when we, we you go to Aladdin's Castle or Time Zone or whatever, we would go golf land. We would come in with a hand of quarters and we'd play like Street Fighter or something. And you'd put your quarters up because that's how many times I get to play this. And somebody's like, I got next. They have to put their quarter up. So the whole point of business and life and game is how many quarters can you stack up? Because you want to play the game for as long as possible. We know that no matter how good you are, it is finite because the time is ticking down already. So you got to just stack the quarters. So what we do is we, we, we learn a skill, a couple of quarters. That's good. But we will run out of quarters banking just on skill. And that's a trap. A lot of people, creative people fall down. And they're not entirely to blame. Because it's an idea that's perpetuated by academics within mm-hmm. their schools. They say, like, just work on your craft, 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 craft <laughs> until you die. Let's celebrate more craft. Let's have shows about craftsmanship. Let's have speakers who obsess over craft. Where's the business part? Right. I'm the guy in the back. I'm about to, like, explode out of my skin here. Like, hey, you donkeys, when do we get to talk about how to sell this stuff? Yeah. How to speak about it? How to be positioned in the marketplace so that we attract the right kinds of buyers for our services? So they keep playing the craft game. And we know that a certain level, it's diminishing return on investment of time. Yeah. Like you're good. You're like nationally good. Being more good or gooder, not a real word, is not really going to change your game. So what we have to do is we have to learn another skill set. Maybe we need to learn communication or presentation or sales or marketing, lead generation, conversion, strategy, branding. Maybe we should try one of those things because that will help us. Okay, so the mindset of the creator person is just to get better at craft. If I make the most pristine video, if the video is extra crispy, as you like to say, as the young people say, or, you know, oh, I came up with a super dope transition. Yeah, that's cool. But did you help that person's business grow? Boom. That's all it is. That's really good. And I can make an inferior video and still get better results. And, and I have evidence for this. Who does? Who is the most prolific, successful YouTube creator right now? Mr. Beast. What do you think about the quality of his videos? I mean, he. Inten- I mean, he's talked about being in 1080. They they've leveled up as of late, but no, it's like it's Merp. Mer. Yeah. M e r. Merp. Merp. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like learning some new lingo here, Rich. See, you got to stay young with the kids. <laughs> No cap. No cap. <laughs> like this guy just learned cap the other night. <laughs> no, yeah. He, Super he is white. Top YouTuber, and yeah. he doesn't have the, the sharpest video. Yeah. And he could. Yeah. He has the, the money, but he doesn't. And I, I have a theory as to why. When I want to see pristine video, I'm going to watch an Apple TV series. I'm going to watch an HBO production. I'm going to watch a Netflix thing. I don't tune into YouTube because I want pristine video with just flawless lines of words and editing. I don't need that. Actually, that creates a barrier between me and that person. Mm. So sometimes in the pursuit of the perfect pixel, we create a barrier and we don't want that barrier. Dang, YouTube juice. (laughs) So how much did you- Not merp, no cap. (laughs) Juice. Juice. (laughs) How much did you pay that business uh, coach? How long into your journey was that your first investment into yourself? Uh, Because that's actually- you know, you, you, in humility, you said you don't have the business acumen. And then five minutes later, you're like, yo, you got to learn sales, conversion, <laughs> fulfillment, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, retention. <laughs> Back massages. You got to learn it all. Yeah. You have but to. How long and you, you do s- learn it, right? Yeah. So in the very beginning, 
all of us, unless for whatever reason, the stars are aligned just perfectly for us, we will struggle for a period of time. You may, I know our friend Sean probably has, we all struggle, like we'll all kind of be broken at some point. And then we hit this point. And then we hit that proverbial road, the fork in the road, and we have to make a decision. Do we want to do more of the same and suffer? Mm. Or are we going to change? Sadly, the vast majority of the people in our space choose the right road, which is the wrong road to lead down the path of more of the same. Mm. And then they cry and they feel the world is unfair. I hear from them all the freaking time. Yeah. And I feel so bad for them. My heart does go out to them. But I say, friend, if, if nothing changes, nothing changes. You're just going to keep doing this. Let's try something else. I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's the whole reason why Trump got elected. He's like, I'm not saying I'm a great option. I'm not even saying I'm a good human being, but you want more of the same? That's an interesting platform to run on, mm -hmm. right? Because people are like, yeah, my life ain't great. I don't want more of the same. I want something different. We sure got something different, all right, but that's another topic. So let's try to choose something else. So what, was hiring my business coach care the first investment in myself? No, it's one of many and it's a continual perpetual investment in myself. You might read some books, that's an investment in yourself. I attended workshops. I attended a sales workshop, made my skin crawl out of my mind. I ran out of that meeting, I'm like never again. That's Boy. the last super sales webinar you know, uh, in person. It was horrific, buy my books in the bag. I'm like, there's zero value being created here. Wow. All of this was to qualify people to move up the chain to buy more products for that person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want that. Yeah. I don't want that. I don't know why they keep doing that. So I'm like, I ran from that. I, 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 I've taken, I've enrolled in a weekend course to learn video editing. I pay people to say like, hey, will you share some of what you know? And they're like, nah, don't worry about it. I'll tell you what I know. I'm like, great, even better. Mm -hmm. At least let me buy you lunch or something. So we're investing in ourselves all the time. So about five or six years into my business, at this point, we're doing about two, two million, two point two million dollars every year, and I'm like, "Hey, what's the next threshold?" Because I'm not content with that. Let's go. There's a glass ceiling. I want to break past it. I meet my business coach, Kier McLaren. I work with him. He helps me to change. First year, three point nine million dollars. Wow. Okay, and that was just the lowest it's ever been since then. So we just keep jamming after that. I wind up working with Kier for thirteen plus years. I met with him every single week for thirteen years. I put in the work. For many of those years, this is the funny thing about YouTube. Y'all, I'm 51 years old. I created my first video when I was 42. So 12 years after this guy <laughs> is alive, I start my first video. Wow. But by then, I've already put in a decade of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many years I've been working with Kira at that point. And so I'm gonna go on the internet, having the experience of teaching, directing commercials, making music videos with some of the biggest brands and bands in the world, reflecting what it is I've learned. So people are like, um, how hard was it? Well, you go put in your 10 years and you see how hard it is. Yeah. And if you're good year one, congratulations, you're a freaking genius. The rest of us, we just got to work for it. That's really good. What What is the, the thing you want to get better in right now? Marketing. We suck. Okay, dang. That's one of, that was one of the questions I had. <laughs> <laughs> was like, why you suck? <clears throat> yeah, why, you, yeah, why do you suck? Yeah. Um, but w what's, I think people can sometimes mistake the two of what like the difference between branding and marketing yeah but you're a genius when it comes to branding and you just said like we suck at marketing why do you think you suck at marketing with millions of subscribers almost a million on instagram at the time of shooting this like why would you say that i say that because i look at the results sadly I'll, I'll talk real with you right now so well, let's get into some numbers okay um last year i think we did a little over five million dollars in revenue none of it comes from client work we've been client free our, our freedom date is december 2018. Oh, wow. we stopped doing client work that's it it's an important date for us it's like our emancipation right sorry if i use that word how much people are still with you from 2018 because you say we good question just a small handful okay some didn't make the transition, some didn't want the transition, and some of them have left recently to pursue their own career doing what we do. So I love them for that. So yeah. bravo, congrats, Matthew. Thank Good you. job. All right. But you know, we 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 changed, we evolved, right? So um so so last year I said we did a little over five million dollars. This year I don't think we're gonna break five million, which is concerning to me. It's like I only want to move in one direction, it's up. <laughs> I don't want to believe in gravity, I just want to keep moving up. And so, and I think about companies and people who sell one product, do one course that's semi-mediocre, but understand their niche really well and they do $10 million of sales every single year and they do one big promotion or something like that, they're done. And I think that's cool, but I don't want that because mm -hmm. I'm not doing this purely in pursuit of money. Money's just a scorecard for the impact I get to make. So we're trying to change education. 
But in order for us to think big and actually make the kind of impact I want, we need lots of capital to burn, to hire more people to keep doing what we're doing. And it's okay that we don't make a ton of money. I just want to play it on a bigger stage. And so that's the problem. We have a bunch of courses. I think we're okay at marketing. And the difference between marketing and branding is marketing is focusing on sales and revenue, where brand is focused on long-term value creation. I, I have no doubt that the long-term value creation in the brand that we've built will be worth a lot of freaking money. But in order to get it to that point, we have to keep playing. We need more quarters on the, on the dash there. Mm -hmm. We just need it. Otherwise, I can't get it to that level. Okay, and I don't want to do it by myself. I don't want to do it as a three-person operation. I want to do it as a 50, 100-person operation, creating the kind of content and educational materials that's going to transform the lives of the people, not just in this country, but all over the world. That's the mission. That's good. And I have a really big freaking mission. You know how uh, Gary Vaynerchuk says, I'm going to buy the Jets? Right. So we, we understand what's motivating Gary. Some childhood immature obsession over the Jets, and he just needs to do it. I know there's a video on that that explains why. I want to make enough money I can go out and buy an art school and transform the entire school. That's going to require a lot of money. It's probably going to require more than $100 million. I want to change it. I want to change the game. You know, there's this thing, I'm a Game of Thrones fan. It's like um, Danny uh, Targaryen. She's like, we don't want to keep, the wheel just keeps going. One king is replaced by another king, by a queen, whatever. She wants to break the wheel. I want to be a wheel breaker. That's good. What What are you doing now to like make your way toward? Because here, here's you're supposed to say Khaleesi, but you missed your mark. <laughs> I don't watch. I didn't watch. Oh, Game you didn't of watch Thrones. Yeah, okay. so that's why I missed my mark. Sorry. Do old people watch Game of Thrones only? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. no smart people do. <laughs> yeah, dang it. Rip. <laughs> um, Skull emoji. No, you say a hundred million to trans. It, is it because you're you're thinking about transforming it in its traditional sense? Because you want to know the plan? I'll tell you the plan right yeah. now. Yeah, I'll just put it out there. I went to Art Center. Yeah. Art Center is not for sale, but I'd like to buy Art Center. They have four buildings. They have a bunch of like what I would consider institutional knowledge, world-class instructors. They have antiquated programs on how to de disseminate that. They're working on it. No, no shade. But I would just like to go and buy it. Sadly, let go of most of the administrators. Yeah. Create a hybrid school where there's like in-person gathering space, theaters, uh, common areas, uh, workshops and labs, and then bring in guest speakers. So but cool. try to turn as much of the knowledge into a digital product as we can to share with our students who have different learning modalities, who may be like uh, visually or hearing impaired so that we can we can address that. But also sometimes people need to see something 14 times before it gets through their head. Yeah, right. And then to be able to disseminate that across the world for a fraction of what it costs today. The goal would be to take eight semesters worth of tuition, turn it into one and offer the exact same program. I think that's really good. I went to UNLV for broadcast journalism. Before that, in high school, I took broadcast journalism and I just stuck with it, you know? People would say like, dude, you're just so gifted. I'm like, no, I just never put down the camera. I would hope that I'd be good at what I do this many years. And the funny thing about it, when I was in college, was learning, it, I almost feel like when you when you, when you you have to standardize education, the, the it takes a long time to steer the ship, which is why there was literally people who were doing like when they when they were journalists, they were literally typing on typewriters and like newspapers and stuff. And like at the time, it was like 20, oh, 2009, you know, where Twitter is coming along and like news is starting to be changed. And it made me think a lot about the, t the signs of times and trying to bring relevant information to a large group of people and also change it when it needs to be changed, but it not be so standardized. Like I, what, how would you see like your way being different in that? Because I would say that's why they suck, the art institutes, is because they feel like in order to change this thing, we have to, it has to go through the, a process that makes it like, now nah, we'll just keep teaching the same thing then. Yeah, I think the art institute wound up closing, right? Yeah. There's some scandal there too. <laughs> that I can't speak to because I don't know, unfortunately. Because I was really close to going. I was because I you was. Dodge bullet, brother. Yeah, you dodge sure. bullet. <laughs> Here's the problem: is that for a lot of people who are uninformed buyers of products and services, what looks like a thing isn't a thing. Like what looks like a Louis bag may not be a Louis bag after all. It might be this fifty dollar knockoff, Bugazi. right? Yeah. <laughs> 
right? So what happens is there are real institutions who know how to teach. And then they're like, well, why don't we create something that looks and sounds and, you know, and we'll hire the third tier teachers who couldn't get there and we'll teach them here. And then we'll take your money. We'll help your parents pay for the education through loans and all that kind of stuff. And they go through this and it can only sustain itself for so long. Mm. And then you look at the quality of education and the and you can, it's demonstrated in the students themselves. Like what art institute, sorry, shade throwing, wound up doing something significant. And and if they did, then probably the school had little to do with it. And that's actually because they were actually really talented before they got there. Right. And so it has the look and feel of something that's high quality, but it is not. So we're not talking about that. Let's talk about taking a really great school and trying to make it better. So the thing that works against this is it's run by committees. Mm -hmm. There's usually a board of trustees and a whole bunch of people trying to like guide this thing that are not 100% vested in outcome. They just want to make safe, conservative decisions. Naturally, I understand why. And then you have just legacy. Well, our forefathers did it this way and then their forefathers did it this way. Why wouldn't we just keep doing it? Well, I don't know if you've noticed the world's changed a lot. There's lots of tools and things that are available to us that we can do now. Here's the example I would give to you. Four years ago, we thought work from home or remote work was a terrible idea. Now it's the predominant way in which most companies are run. And they've been able to do something that's really important. They've decentralized their operation so that there's no cataclysmic failure in case the IT system goes down. Well, everybody's working from home. Their computers are still working. The internet's still working. And this is good. So we have some redundancy. So we have these kinds of programs for finances, for computer, for security. Why wouldn't we have it for people? So it totally makes sense. So when we're forced to change and innovate, we will change and we will innovate. Unfortunately, there's no motivation here to change or innovate because they're not forced to. So I feel like I'm that force, a force from the future to say like, I will create a new business model to then threaten you with love. There's another model here. Mm -hmm. And until we make enough success and noise, they will not feel threatened. Today, we're nothing. We're like the flea in the back of the butt. No one cares. But one day we won't be that flea and we'll be a small dog and it will bark a lot. And eventually people are like, wait, what's happening here? That's really good. And think about this. My business coach told me this. He goes, when companies acquire smaller, more innovative companies, it looks like they just bought them. It's the other way around. I'm like, what? So when Disney bought Pixar, you think, oh, they just absorbed them, killed the competition. And he goes, that's not what's going to happen. It's weird. Financially, they bought them, but Pixar bought Disney because the Pixar people will be running Disney. Mm. And sure enough, John Lasseter, the, the whole team, because they're so good at doing what they do that Disney realized in animation, we just need to learn from them. So they paid them a lot of money and they acquired all the top talent and they put them in executive decision-making roles. So it's not what you think. That's wild. So this might happen too, where a big institution is like, we love the innovative thinking. We can't get there. So we just buy you. And now you tell us what to do. You sit on the board. You run the company. And that's what we'll do. We'll start to change it. That's cool. You, will you probably, will you call it the future? Because that'd be fire. That, that, that name works for me right now. Yeah, no, it's dope. I honestly had the same thought over the summer because somebody came to me and was like, yo, I'm looking for a, a like a, a content person. So now that we're in this era where, you know, having somebody, at least one person that understands photo, video, and all these things uh, matters. And I just operated in that role for a long time. And then I see Gary Vee as D-Rock. And D-Rock, you know, brought a new breed of genre when it comes to creativity. And that is almost like a Swiss army knife of a creative that you understand the um, the reason why you're following somebody around and filming them and all that stuff. I call him a shredditor. Kind of me and Sean kind of like, we kind of came up with that idea. And some guy was like, yo, I got like 80, I got like 80 to 100K for this person. Do you know anybody? And like, honestly, I've made a handful of them, but they all work for other people now. And, you know, my, my brain has been trying to wrap around like, how do I systemize the approach to be able to create shredditors because it's a guaranteed like 50, 60 at minimum if you are a young gun wanting to just get a secure job and live somewhere, you know, like, and then being almost like this agency that can, um, well, not agency, but like, you know, they can hire people that are certified, you know. You want me to design the business model for you? Please. Okay, I'll do it for you right now. Okay. If you do and you're super successful, send me some money later. 
I okay. Will. Here's there's a couple of parts to it. You know, one of the things that I think is a benefit to being like people like you and me is we get to be around really freaking smart people. We're only stupid if we don't actually learn from them. Right. Because they're just spilling ideas all over the place. So I've learned uh, these concepts from different people who are in my circle. I'm very grateful for that. The first part is you set up an academy and the outcome is very clear. Earn fifty to $100,000 a year traveling the world, working with super influential people. And you're, not only are you going to produce work for them, but you're going to be within a hair's breadth away from your, the mentor of your dreams. How does that sound? Okay, join me. I'm going to teach you how to do this. The systems, the techniques, the storytelling, the structure, the strategy. And upon completion, my other agency, a placement agency, will help you find a job with one of those people. The placement agency is in contact with all these influential people. It's like, you need a person. I got the right person, right temperament, the right, whatever it is that right. you need. And uh, the minimum that you're going to pay them is 60 or 80, whatever you work out to be. But you have to charge a placement fee with them. Right. And that's going to be 20K. Okay. Now, here's the cool thing. Everybody that applies in your program, you don't accept because they're not all good enough. They have to demonstrate certain things because the biggest okay. thing that you have to do is you have to filter who goes through your program right. because that's going to largely determine how you're going to be successful. I have this theory. Harvard is not the best school in, in the country or in the world. They're just the best at picking the future winners. Mm. Look at Bill Gates, dropout. Uh, Zuckerberg, dropout. Uh, all these guys are just in gals or dropouts because they're going to be successful. So what Harvard did was they created a powerful enough magnet that they would apply so that they can say Harvard dropout. Yeah. And that's important. So when they're super successful, they go back and donate a ton of freaking money. And they can say, well, we'll give you an honorary degree. You know, those kinds of things work. Now, all the rejects that you have, this may or may not be ethical, but I'm going to say it. You sell the rejects as a name to UNLV's video department program because they need students and they can work with them mm. and they will pay you money for those qualified leads. So these people have already expressed intent. We want to learn. We want a career in journalism and video videography or editing. You're like, you know what? You, you move them over there. Dude, it's amazing. There's a three-way business model right yeah. there. No, and that's, that's when I mapped it out, I, I saw that part. The thing I, here's the thing I struggle with is the idea that you, a lot of these entrepreneurs you would work for, and I'm seeing it, they're losing a lot of their creatives because they sell a lifestyle type of business, freedom, you know, do what you want. And, and then, but the guy who's filming them say that message can't, can't live by that. And so what's happening is, is like the creatives want to be entrepreneurs, but it's like, no, dude, you got paid for it. You're, you're getting a salary for this job. And it's like, I also paid $20,000 for you to be here. Like that, that's kind of the thing that I like, I'm like, I don't know how much I involvement I have in that part, but it would, it would speak to the placement agency that like, Hey, this didn't work out after a while. Well, it's like, well, they had the talent, but this person, and I know you, somebody might just say, Oh, just have them sign a contract. Well, I mean, I guess, but you, do you know what I'm saying? No. What's like, the problem? That like, you, 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 I'm guaranteeing like a salary job essentially with the placement agent, agency. But the people, the types of people they work for, make build their self belief to want to go out and build their own thing. So it's it's a thing that's happening. Like, you mean the people you place then will wind up leaving and doing their own thing? Right. Well, how's that your problem? I'll tell you something. Because I placed them. No, it's not your problem. Do you know how this works? Have you ever hired a recruitment like a headhunting agency before? I have. Okay. That's how I know that how this works. Okay. So here's the skinny. They place people. The better they are, the less duds they send you to look at as candidates. They make 20%. If they quit or you fire them with a certain amount of time, then you help them find someone else at no extra charge. But after a certain period of time, it's not your problem anymore. Yeah, okay. They're hungry and desperate for someone to do the work. For one reason or another, either they're not inspiring or they're cruel, or they're not good people, right. or the person didn't wind up having a good ethic beyond that, then they all part ways. All you have to do is call up a recruitment agency right now, find out the terms and policies. Actually, you can just skip the whole process. Type into ChatGPT, I need a boilerplate placement agency contract that follows industry standards and norms about fees and termination agreement. Have it drafted for you. It'll just pull it right out and just save you some money. Yeah, that's fire. Okay, just... Put anything. Okay, you 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 mentioned it. AI. Um, I just wrote a few things down because I'm not I'm not resistant for it. 
you know, like there are some things that are like pretty interesting. Um, what are your thoughts around AI stuff like, you know, put it, you've put this phrase in, it creates that graphic, um, you know, as far as like the skill that no longer, we talked about so much about like putting in the time and the reason why there was so much that you had to offer because you spent a lot of time doing a thing and it's kind of like the time to do a thing is, is getting smaller and faster and requiring less discovery, um, which makes a person. I don't know. What are your thoughts on AI? If you and I had an opinion about AI and it actually impacted what's going to happen in the future, then I would love to talk to you about it. But no amount of you and me talking is going to slow climate change or to change the conversation that's happening with AI. It's not going to happen. So if we, if, we, if we accept a new reality where there's climate change, AI is going to, to completely uh, disrupt every industry possible, then the only real question that we should have is, what are we going to do to incorporate AI into what we do to enhance our productivity, our creativity, and everything else? So here's what I think, and I've thrown this out in front of entrepreneurs before, is I want you to imagine when, you're, when your daughter is 22 years old and she looks back on this time and says, Dad, that was the greatest economic upheaval and opportunity in the last 2,000 years. Daddy, why aren't we in the golden tower right now? Daddy, what did you do with AI? Mm. You're like, oh, you know, I slept on it. I slept on it, I resisted, I didn't do it, or I was slow to adopt and we were destroyed. Well, that's why we live in this part of town and not that part of town. Mm. Yeah, I just want you to think about it like that. Okay, so if you're not incorporating AI into your workflow, to automating certain things, to improving your customer service, onboarding experience, helping you to generate ideas, helping you take tedious things away from what you're doing, which you already are, by the way, then you're, then you're gonna get left in the dust. Fire. That's it. So if you were teaching somebody Photoshop graphic design, is that a is that now a quicker delivery of education information? Because now it's like, yo, you don't have to use the masking tool. Just I don't know. You know, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. You still do, because it ain't perfect. The cutout yeah. ain't perfect. There's some fundamental skills that you need to, but I'm gonna flip the question in a totally different way, which is well, if I want to learn Photoshop, what should I do? Well, why don't you just ask AI? Design me a curriculum that's seven weeks long that allows me to watch a combination of videos and read tutorials for four minutes or four hours a day with clear actionable outcomes that are in line with industry standards to, to work in a job doing X, Y, and Z. Design that for me. I'm a 24-year-old kid. I have ADHD. And you know I can only sit in a chair for 10 minutes at a time. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So forget about the threat of like, do we need to learn rotoscoping because AI will cut it out for us? But think about like, how do we become an enhanced human in the pursuit of creativity and self-expression while we utilize all the tools in front of us, not just some. That's really good. I love that. You see the shift there? No, yeah. One is threatening, one is embracing. Right. Yeah. I think it's dope. Like literally, Neil just texted me because I did an interview with Neil. Um, and he was like, yo, I threw our interview in Opus Clips. And it literally sent, gives you 10 clips. And he's like, bro, they're actually not that bad, <laughs> you know? And I was like, turn up, dude, run it, you know? Um, turn up, Rich, turn up. <laughs> turn up. The, yesterday we were here and you were interviewing uh, Layla Hermosi. And before the interview, you asked her, like, is there stuff that you are excited about or want to talk about? I didn't ask you that question, but. Are we at that point in the interview now? Yeah. You earned it. <laughs> cue, cue the violin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the music's no, beginning. But what, yeah, what's exciting you now? And like, what what what's kind of been the thing that um, you would hope that somebody would ask you the questions about? I, I get so many opportunities to speak that I'm not quite sure how to answer that stupid question. I don't know who asked that question in the first place. <laughs> no, I mean, Omar, are there things that you wish that I would talk more about? I'd be happy to talk about them. I'm a pretty open book, so if there's something you want to know, and I don't want to presume that what I think is interesting is what you might think is interesting. Well, so are there are there things like little nooks and crannies like, hey, I thought I heard a rumor about this, and I'm happy to talk about it. No, I guess something that comes to mind is that you probably spent a lot of your time behind a computer, and now you just said that you do a lot of speaking. 
And I know you mentioned getting better at communication, um, but what have you found about speaking and the iterations and what makes people draw to you in a room when you have an hour? I think we've lost the art of rhetoric, the art of conversation, the art of listening. And I think whether you're speaking on a podcast like this or on stage in front of hundreds or thousands of people, we have to remember that there are humans sitting on the other side of that stage that want to have an experience with you. So if you're going to just sit there and talk about yourself and talk at them, talk over them, you're really missing the opportunity. And it's quite sad to me. Like I go to conferences a lot these days and I get to see speakers. And for the most part, with a few exceptions, of course, they're really boring. It's very mechanical what they do. It's very produced in mm -hmm. terms of like they're not going to have a misspoken word or a slide that's got one typo in it. And I think, like, why don't I just watch this on YouTube? Ted already does this better than you, friend. Dang. Why are you doing this right now? And you're killing my brain. You're killing my time. I'm starting to resent you. I'm resenting this conference. And those are not good feelings. And I look around the room like, is anybody else feeling this? Or am I just the only person awake in the matrix right now? And sometimes I feel like I'm the only one. Then I go backstage and I talk to a couple of friends I really trust. And I really let them know how I feel. I'm like, dude, I can't believe you feel this way too. Yet we commit the same sin over and over again. And I try not to do that. When I go up on the stage, very rarely is it ever rehearsed. Uh, I look at my slides. I'm like, I hope I got in the right order a couple of times. And then I go and do my thing. And I want to feel the energy of the room. Mm. I think all public speakers would do better if they were to study crowd work from comedians and learn to work with the audience to be more improvisational, to be more conversational. So I'll tell you some things that you can do right now. Just right now, if you got a talk that you're doing tomorrow in front of your company, board of directors or clients or thousands of people, here are two or three things that you can do. Number one, ask the audience real questions. Don't ask them purely rhetorical questions. Like literally ask them, why are you here? I'd love to hear from you. And just say that and just talk to them. Like, I want to have a conversation with you right now. And try to let go of the need for it to follow a very specific talk track and just be a little bit more improvisational. The more that you can do that, the better. Number two is to learn to use your entire body and your body language. And I think a lot of times we have this model of what perfection looks like and we try to emulate that. And so we walk, we're stiff, we have our hands a certain way, we're very professorial. And it's like, yo, it's okay if you shrug your shoulders. It's okay if you raise your hands like this. Express and communicate through the entire body, not just like this. This is really, really important. And I think the last thing is, if you have voices, if you can bring a little bit more of like the quirkiness of who you are on there, onto the stage, into the platform, you're going to connect and hit with so many people. I'm going to show, I'm going to present this to you. Basketball was played a very specific way for a really long time. They wore really short shorts. Mm -hmm. uh, they had bad haircuts and they would dribble and do layups. There was no three pointer. That's it. And then black people get in the game and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa, this game is fun now. It's interesting. It's improvisational. It's a little flashy and it's, it's really fun to watch. And you start to see innovation happen. And I think there's something that's really beautiful about black culture here in America is that there's this lyricism to the, to the way black culture interprets music, fashion, architecture, design, sports, performance, comedy, that gives everyone else permission. It's like, oh, we never had to do it this way the whole time. Mm. And they're like, no one told us we, we couldn't do it, so we're just going to do it. Yeah. When you come from a place of not having a lot, you have to use your imagination and you start to break rules. So like, oh, we could do anything. And I think that's what's really interesting. So speaking as a person of color, if I can just say that, it's like I try to bring in my culture, my flair, my emotion, my, my quirkiness, my comedy, my humor, my sarcasm, my sometimes inappropriate jokes. I'm just going to bring them because you know what? I don't care if you hate me, hate me, but I'm just going to be me. Great. Last thing. Uh, you know Russell Brunson? I know of him. He says, he says, he defines marketing as, he would say, marketing is attracting and repelling. Would you say branding is attracting and repelling? 
Yes, but I think we're saying it in different ways. Mm. I think attracting a branding is attracting and repelling, attracting more people who identify with what you're about and repelling the ones that are not. I think marketing is attracting in that it's attracting money and revenue, but it's repelling as it's like repulsive to me. The the kinds of tactics that marketers use, they're in for a short term revenue gain, and they'll do anything and everything they can to get that buck. Mm. We've been burned. All of us have been burned by one program or another. They had not lived up to its to its marketing, and that's problematic. So I think the the like the traditional marketer that many of us have problems with. They think they can just find an infinite number of new customers or new suckers to sell to, and they will, and they'll keep doing that until they make enough money they can invest in legitimate businesses. It seems like that's the way it goes. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? As soon yeah. as I said that, I saw you smart. Like, yeah, yeah I, I know the plan. I've seen it before. I would rather just build slowly if it means that we're not going to be a $10 million company as fast as I, I would like it to be. So be it. But I'm really interested in building audience, community, and meaningful connection. And if that takes a gazillion years, let it take that long. What it, so, I mean, you have been able to make decent revenue. Yeah. What do you do with your revenue? I invested in our people. I invested in our programs. And that's where I'd like to go. So let's say tomorrow you're like, Chris, I'm, I'm a billionaire. I'm a philanthropist. I would just want to give you $10 million. What would you do? No strings attached. Do whatever you want because we just, we just love you and we want to support what you do. Here's what I would do. I would... Um, take some of the, the ideas that I think are successful now and just run it at massive, massive scale. So what I would like to do is to onboard a whole bunch of teachers that I think are amazing, give them a $15,000 advance and say, take the time it's necessary to write and produce your course. We know you can teach, but we need to know that you can teach in video format and we will then just produce that. So I would probably need 10 producers and, and a bunch of editors working with them so that we're just onboarding them as fast as possible when they're ready to make the content and then to sell that content for a fraction of what it would cost you to get in a normal traditional brick and mortar school. That's what I would wanna do. So that's gonna be a money losing proposition all day long until it's not. Mm -hmm. So when you're about 50 or 100 courses deep into your catalog, all of a sudden now that catalog becomes super valuable because somebody's going to have a good experience with this professor and say, oh, you have this other thing? I, I wasn't even, oh, I didn't know that was available and this sounds really cool and I had a good experience and they just keep doing that. So then all the instructors win and then the future is in a school wins. Mm -hmm. But when we only have a smattering of courses, like the, the end of the journey is quite quick. You might take three or four courses from us like, oh, that's that's kind of all they got. Because literally that's all we got. That's what happens when you're bootstrap, strap, self-financed person who believes in ethical long-term brand building, even though if it means that our marketing sucks. Mm, that's really good. And I like that. I mean, you didn't you didn't say stash it away in real estate or no. invest in stocks. Um, there's a seems like a, the concept of being of retirement is not one that you uh, subscribe to it was or, or pay a retainer to I'm you know <laughs> <laughs> well played um chasing retirement was an idea i had until i found out i could retire and i'm like i don't want to retire it's stupid <laughs> so i don't need more money for more money's sake this is where i start to kind of get confused because there's a lot of people we know that only live a certain way like People have an ex like crazy amounts of money. They don't live like that. So what do you do with all that extra money? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is just because the idea of winning more is fun for them. But then it's like, wouldn't the idea of helping more people be better? Hmm. You notice this happens a lot in uh, in the age of the tycoons, the railroad tycoons, the steel tycoons. When they got older, they found God. They found religion. And they started to give all their money away. But they waited a mother freaking long time to give that money away. You could be doing it on the ascension. Right. And I'm not giving money away like I'm doing charity because charity runs out. It doesn't empower people. You're only feeding them for the day. What I'm talking about is investing in tools to empower people to achieve a lifetime of earning. That's the way I'm going to do this. So Good. there's no point for me to make $10 million and put in a bank. What am I going to do with that? Mm -hmm. To make more money that I'm not going to spend? Yeah, I might buy another chain or something, but other than that, another Louis you know, bag. another bag. I mean, uh, you know, I need another bag. Daddy <laughs> needs a new bag. But outside of that, it's like I'd rather just use that money to help people. And here's the best part, just trying to bring the whole conversation in, in a little loop here to bookend it, right? We talked about personal branding at the beginning. 
and branding. I think, I mean, I, I, I am very fortunate to live this life that I get to live, that the message that we send out through the internet literally reaches some kid in Ghana mm. who doesn't have the opportunity that people here have, the financial um, resources, the mobility, just nothing. But somehow they can watch that video and start to apply that and transform their lives. And I know this because they send me messages. Mm -hmm. I know this because when I walk the streets and somewhere other than where I live, someone will come up to me in some weird corner of the world. It's like, you changed my life. I'm like, what do you mean? And I hear this. I used to earn minimum wage. And then last year I did $150,000. This year I'm going to do two fifty. dollars To this, this makes me smile from ear to ear. And I give them a big hug and I say, I shouldn't say this, but I say it anyways, because I think it'll impact them. I say, I'm really proud of you. Mm. Please continue. That's good. And don't forget to send me some money. <laughs> yeah. Because daddy need a new bag. That's all. <laughs> Dang. Dude, guys don't hear that. Which part? The new bag? No, the that part too. <laughs> no, the proud of you. Yeah. I, I had a friend tell me that. Yeah. Uh, he was like, hey, Omar, I just want... I don't know the last time you heard it, but like legit, bro, I'm, I'm proud of you as a friend, bro. It got me because I was like, dang, you I, haven't, up a little I bit? haven't heard that. Maybe. Yeah. I haven't heard that from a man, even though he was a friend, you know, like, yeah. like man to man, it, it, it does something to hear that because, uh, probably we don't hear it enough. Yeah. Um, but dude, thanks so much. Could you, uh, let people know where would they go next step with you from this conversation? Yeah. Before I say that. Uh, my wife and I, we went to uh, like a like a, a relationship building workshop course, yeah. and there was this man who was teaching it, and we were watching videos and reading his book, and he says like we all want love, but love is such an abstract concept. So let's try to make it less abstract. He goes, we just want to be acknowledged and appreciated. That's so fundamental and it's so easy to do. I see you, and I'm grateful for you. Mm. So I know this because I understand about a little bit about human psychology is when I look at people in the eye, I know, I know that most people are a little bit broken inside and they needed a word of encouragement in their life and they didn't get it from probably one of their parents or both. So when I really want to touch somebody emotionally, like just strike a nerve with them, I just look them in the eye and just like, you're deserving, you're good, and you need to be nothing more than that. And I just see you. And I do that and men start crying immediately in front of me. And it's like, it's okay. It's okay to cry. And I think if the world kind of operated on this principle of just acknowledging people and, and appreciating them just a little bit, it doesn't take anything. It'd be a better place. So I'm going to look at you all in the eye right now and say, you're worthy and I'm proud of you. Keep it up. And on that note, if you'd like to follow me and find out some more information about what we do, I'm on most social channels at the Chris Doe. That's D O. And if you're interested in the future, my future and yours as well, it's the future, F U T U R.com. It's not the further, it's the future. Thanks very much. Appreciate you. There, dude, there's a scripture that, that hits that. Yeah. So when, when Jesus comes, he goes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist baptizes Jesus in the, in the, uh, the Jordan River. And, and then it says in all the gospels, it says this account, a dove comes upon him and a voice from the sky says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It's the first thing God says about Jesus is that I'm proud of you and I, and I see you. It's kind of crazy, huh? There's but, something there. Yeah.